That's probably better. We're going to be studying Acts chapter 2, uh, continuing on from last week, uh, and really thankful for this opportunity to, to uh, participate in this way. As has been our custom here, we are going to look at a memory verse uh, that, that we focus on each month. This one's in Romans 10, 17, if you don't mind repeating this with me. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, we also are engaged in some other memory tools uh, this quarter and next quarter. This is a two-quarter study. Uh, we'll be really associating a, a letter of the alphabet with each chapter and then helping us to remember what each chapter is about. So A for ascension and apostle chosen was from chapter one. And today is B or beginning of the church for chapter two. So you studied last week about uh, Jesus commanding the apostles not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father when they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from then. Uh, Jesus tells the apostles they'll be witnesses to him in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. So there was a total of 12 apostles again. Uh, we're going to be studying these objectives. Uh, this is really more central to the class, identifying the work of the Holy Spirit, identifying the references to apostolic authority, learning the history of the church and its work, and then learning from the conversions so we might take those effective tools that were used in the first century to teach others the gospel today. So we'll continue in this uh, study together. Uh, I want us to think through this, this uh, chapter as being one of the most central, really, events and chapters in all of Scripture. Uh, everything that is occurring prior to this chapter is really pointing to this event. Uh, everything after this really talks back to this idea of the reality of salvation coming about. Uh, Jesus has performed the, really the last uh, prepara preparatory work for the apostles uh, in, the, in giving them the Great Commission in, in uh, Mark 16 and also beginning at Jerusalem with his final instructions to await the Holy Spirit to come upon them. So we're going to look through this chapter together, think through some things, and um, I'd like to just start off by reading verses 1 through 13 and kind of get our minds back into this uh, study together. So verses 1 through 13 of, of Acts, let's read this together. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Capocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues and the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking, saying, they are full of new wine. So the very first verse in chapter 2 mentions the events that we're going to be talking about here as occurring on the day of Pentecost when it had fully come. And Pentecost literally means 50 days. It's, it's really 50 days after Passover. That's, what, that's when this occurrence took place. But who were all these people there? And why were they gathered in Jerusalem on that particular day? The map that you see in front of you shows you kind of a, a, a a representation of where all these people may have come from as listed in this chapter. They're coming from all parts of the known world. Uh, but they weren't just all people. They were specific people. They were Jews. They had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Shabbat, the Feast of Weeks. And Shabbat was one of the temple feasts when devout Jews were supposed to travel to the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, it commemorates Moses receiving the law from God on Mount Sinai. And on the Jewish calendar, Shabbat falls on the sixth day of Sivian in the late May or early June. 
uh, time frame. It's 50 days, seven weeks after Passover. And the Greek speaking Jews would refer to it by this name, Pentecost. So that's what brought all these people together. If you look in Leviticus 23, 15, uh, we read about God's law on this, this particular feast as to when it should occur. Leviticus 23, 15 through 16. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. This is Pentecost. This is when this was occurring. This was the absolute perfect time to reveal the gospel message. Why do you think this was the perfect time? Why do you think this was the perfect time to reveal the gospel message? Yes, and, and who was the message supposed to be preached to first? The Jews. That's who was gathered here. Oh, this was the perfect time to share this gospel message with the nation of Israel. Many Jews from all over the known world would have been gathered there to hear this message taught and to witness the miracles that were being uh, worked there. So what happened on the day of Pentecost? What happened on this particular day? This, this was unlike any other Pentecost. Something happened here that was unusual. What occurred? What's that? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually was poured out on the apostles on that day. What did it sound like? A mighty rushing wind. So it was, it was audible. You could hear something. All these people gathered heard something. Um, and, and what did it look like when this, came, when this happened? Yeah, J.D.? This chapter, the, you know, what they could see were, as described, tongues of fire on top of the apostles. So you could, why, why do you think that God may have chosen the, the divided tongues of fire to represent what was going on that day? Well, you mentioned Pentecost ties back to Sinai and the giving of the law to Moses. So one of the reasons for the fire images, that's what happened back in Exodus 19. So he's making a tie back to the giving of the old covenant to now the giving of the new covenant. And why would it look like tongues? They're going to be speaking other languages. They're going to be revealing this truth. It, it, this is not just some random occurrence, some random smattering of, of just, oh, by chance. The, this was very well planned out. God had planned this out, and He planned this for, for a time in which it would be perfect to re unveil this new teaching, this new covenant. Uh, there was evidence provided, sound of the mighty rushing wind. There was visible evidence. You could see the divided tongues as of fire sitting upon the apostles. There was evidence to the mind for them to contemplate and intellectually see they're speaking other languages. Something supernatural is going on here. Something unusual is happening. There's clear evidence of divine power on this day. Wouldn't it be clear that something unusual, something unique was taking place? They saw it. They heard it. They could intellectually understand what was going on. Um, there was the promise of the Father regarding the Holy Spirit baptism delivered to the apostles this day. And we see these promises back in John 14 uh, when Jesus tells His apostles on John 14, 15, and 16. He's meeting with them in, as a group there. Uh, he says He will give you another helper. The Father is going to give you this helper in John 14, 16. Uh, John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And John 15, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. And you will also be, you will bear witness because you have been with Me from the beginning. Uh, in Acts 1 through uh, 4 through 5, of course, we have them waiting in Jerusalem for this to occur. Uh, we see that this promise of the Holy Spirit coming and being poured on the apostles has taken place in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles in the words they spoke on that occasion, and He would continue to guide them in what they were to do and reveal. Now, how do we know in this chapter that it was only the apostles who received the Holy Spirit baptism? Mm -hmm. 
How do we know it was only them? What, was it on all the people that gathered there that they received the Holy Spirit baptism or immersed, poured out on, or was it just the apostles? So two of our objectives this quarter is to identify the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of work going on by the Holy Spirit this chapter, but also learn from the conversions, effective tools for teaching others the gospel. Uh, I don't know if you've had this experience. You probably have, like me, uh, just talking with others about the truth, about the gospel. What is one of the biggest misconceptions that people deal with regarding the gospel? In my view, it is that they are being personally directed by or have some sort of uh, supernatural experience or revelation given to them today. Uh, I hear this from most denominations. Most people I talk with that have some kind of background in the scriptures believe that the Holy Spirit is giving them information, giving them something uh, in addition to what we have revealed in the Scripture. The Holy Spirit is guiding them in some supernatural way, giving them the, the ability to, to actually do things, heal other people, uh, do things that are supernatural. So I think it's important for us to kind of go through and reason through this a little bit, because if we can understand that that was only intended for the apostles, we can help build our own faith that that's the truth, but also help others in understanding the truth about that too. So I want to share a few thoughts with you, and you may have some other thoughts in addition to these. Feel free to, to interject um, about the apostles being the only ones to receive the Holy Spirit baptism. Now, this is different than the, some of the Christians having their hands laid on them by the apostles and receiving Holy Spirit gifts. We're not talking about that. Others receive that. That's how they received it. Holy Spirit gifts were imparted by laying on the hands of the apostles to a Christian who had been uh, baptized into Christ, and they would receive a particular gift. Not all of the gifts, but a particular gift that was willed by the Holy Spirit. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about direct power, direct revelation from the Holy Spirit in the way the, the apostles received it. I believe they're the only ones who received that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit was promised to who? Holy Spirit baptism promised to who? Apostles. Was the Holy Spirit baptism promised to anyone else? No, no one. Um, so we see that in passages. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, one of the key points to this is who was Jesus assembled with whenever he was making that promise? And if you want to jot these down, you can look at John chapter 14, verses 15 through 18. But if you look at some of the other Gospels in Luke, Matthew, and Mark, Luke 22, 14, Matthew 26, 20, Mark 14, 17, you'll see it says over and over again, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him, with Jesus. When evening had come, he sat down with the 12. In the evening, he came with the 12. It's the 12. That's who he's with. He's with the apostles on that evening. When he makes those promises, that's who he's meeting with. Jesus told who to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would come? The apostles. Don't leave. Don't leave Jerusalem. It's the apostles that were told in Acts 1, 4, 4 and 5. All those who spoke in the native language of the people gathered were said to have been Galileans. Who were the apostles? Galileans. That, that's, who was, that, that's, that's who was speaking in the different tongues. It wasn't everyone. We'd already seen on the map, there were people from all over the known world. But who were the ones that were able to speak in the different languages? The Galileans, right? The apostles. So all those who spoke in the native language of the people were Galileans, he, they said in, in the Acts 2, 7. The Holy Spirit came on the apostles, not on all the people gathered, or even those who would be baptized after the gospel sermon was preached for the first time. Remember, if you look at the, the uh, story here, this, this had really escaped me for a long time. I, I was like, wow, why did I not see this? In Acts 2, uh, the very first part of Acts 2, it's when they were all in one accord in one place. And he says in verse uh, 2, the whole house where they were sitting, th th they were in a house sitting together. You know, in my mind, I'd always pictured that they were all out in the open. This all, and then, no, it happened. They were in this house. They were together, the 12. That's when this happened. What, what drew the multitudes? What caused, caused the multitudes to come? The sound of the mighty rushing wind. That's what drew the most of what's going on. What's going on? And then they witness what's happened. But the outpouring of the Holy Spirit did not happen when the multitudes were there. 
So it even makes geographical sense to realize that they were not even part of that group when it occurred. They weren't there. Um, look at also this idea uh, later. We see no evidence of anyone having the ability to pass on spiritual gifts to others except the apostles. There's no evidence. There's even those that would want that gift later on, right? That, oh, I see. That's how this happens. Remember the sorcerer? Saying, oh, that's how, it, right? Simon the sorcerer goes, hey, I want that power. Ah, that'd be, but that's how, that's how they, they get the gifts is through the apostles laying on the hands. So we see Philip was not an apostle. He couldn't impart gifts. He could work miracles. He couldn't impart them. Uh, we only have one case, one case outside the apostles. When Cornelius and his family speak in tongues prior to being baptized, which was intended as a sign for Peter that the Gentiles are worthy to receive salvation. Was that the full measure of the Holy Spirit, the immersion, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, just exactly the way the apostles received it? No, all they were able to do is speak in tongues. They were given one specific gift, and it was meant to be a sign. It was a specific instance for a specific purpose. It was never promised to all Christians. It wasn't promised. Uh, we also see that there's a distinction made between the apostles and others who were, who were uh, uh, considered as appointing as a replacement for Judas. Matthias was appointed, but he was seen as a, a separate from the others. He was designated as an apostle at that time. When the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, it was separate from when the multitude was gathered together. The apostles were gathered in the house, as we mentioned. Peter stands up with who? The eleven. It says he stands with the eleven and proclaims the apostles were not drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. These were truly people speaking languages. Now think about it this way too. If the miracle had taken place, I've heard this, this before from someone. They said, oh no, the miracle took place in the ears of the listeners. That's where all the listeners received the Holy Spirit because now they could, they could hear it in a certain way. No, if that were true, none would have proclaimed that these men were drunk. They would have all understood. But instead, they heard babbling. Like, huh, these babblers, uh, they're drunk. Blah. No, they were speaking other languages. They just didn't know them. So why would anyone have been cynical about that? They all would have understood. But instead, they could not understand all of the languages the apostles were speaking, but only the ones that they knew. So... I firmly believe that the apostles were the only ones to receive the Holy Spirit baptism that day. No one else received it, and I don't believe anyone else will. So uh, this is, uh, amazingly to me, this is really a, the core of a lot of misunderstandings. How could this cause, if someone does believe that others receive the Holy Spirit baptism, what issues could this cause in someone's belief system, the way they believe about the, the Word of God. What, what issues would this cause if I believe that I could receive the Holy Spirit baptism? That I can receive a private revelation? Yeah. Uh, this or that. Yeah. I can get direct messages from God that is new revelation. New. Something beyond what has been recorded for me. So I can get my own and, and I, can, I can reveal things to others that God has revealed to me as truth. What else might be a problem? Yes, sir. I was just going to say, not only could you reveal something new, you could change something that had already been said. Right? Yeah, things could change. Then all of a sudden, this, as I heard in Romania and trying to teach others there on occasion, they said, well, the Bible is just where it started. That's just the starting point. It's changed many, many times over that because the priests are guided by God. They have the Holy Spirit and they guide them into new truths. So I don't need to study the Bible anymore. That's, so, that's like thousands of years old. That has no relevance to me at all now. I have all this new revelation from the priests. That's how this happens, is this core belief that someone else can reveal truth by God's power other than the apostles could the way that he did. Uh, what else? What other issues might this cause? Yes, Stu? Yes. Yeah, you, you see this a lot in the Pentecostal you know, religion. Uh, Presbyterians, some believe that they can speak in tongues. 
uh, in different ways. Well, that's not possible today through the direct operation of the Holy Spirit uh, the way that they were there. Yeah. Okay, good thoughts, good thoughts. Yes, sir. Uh, well, the example I'm going for actually happens here in Bible times, but I'm reminded of when a group of men, uh, perhaps who did believe in God, but uh, they tried to cast out mm-hmm. demons, and yet those same demons absolutely kicked their tails. The sons of Sceva. <laughs> that, uh, if, you know, the problem in a modern sense of what new revelations bring about is the fact that uh, not even the beings of the spirit realm would recognize them or their new truth. Yeah, yeah, understood. Anyone else? I've missed a hand. Yes, Nelson. Um, I can remember having a conversation with uh, a woman that I went to school with who was Pentecostal. I don't know if all Pentecostal people believe this way, but. Her, her church that she went to felt like until you spoke in tongues you weren't a Christian. Yeah. Baptism had nothing to do with it. Repentance had nothing, nothing had anything to do with it other than when you spoke in tongues, now I'm a Christian. Yeah, that's right. All of those misconceptions occur and grow out of this one source of error. So let's let's help teach our children, let's teach others about this so that and, and in a way that we can reason through this chapter and show them just the way we have this morning about why we believe what we believe. We're not just drawing this out of thin air. Uh, this is what the Bible teaches. Uh, verses 5 through 13, they are truly amazed, as we would be. Wouldn't you be amazed if I were up here speaking in 15 different languages anytime I, you know, I could speak in it? Man, that'd be amazing. Uh, Galileans preaching in 15 languages. Again, a layman, somebody that shouldn't know all this, would be doing, that's what's going on. Uh, so there, there were Jews present from all over the world. Um, observation, God desperately wanted the message to be heard. Didn't he want the message to be heard? God wanted this message to get out. He wanted it to be in all these different languages. He wanted everyone to hear it. If you think about that, that's also contrary to some false doctrines today that speak about that God only wants a few. He just wants a few select people. That Even from the very first time the gospel was preached, that's not the intention. The intention was that He wanted everyone to hear it. So He understood that everyone would be there that needed to be there. God in His wisdom knew this was the perfect time, the perfect moment. Um, it was intended to be shared. It was intended to be in all languages that were known at that time, so no one would miss it. Now, all those present were either Jews or proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles who had accepted the law of Moses. These were not just Gentiles in general. Uh, no Gentiles were converted until Acts chapter 10. So the meaning and purpose of this miracle, it provides evidence of, of divine origin of the message. Uh, it refutes many of the uh, modern errors of today uh, that, that we've just spoken about. If also I want to mention, in my view, when I see this, this together and think about the 12 apostles standing up in front of all these people and talking about this and revealing this truth, and they're all seen as uneducated Galileans, I sure do have a lot of hope that God can use me. Don't you have a lot of hope that God can use you? He can use any of us. He can use any of us to bring about His will He can use me no matter what my station in life is, my education level. I can be used by God to reveal truth. Uh, We see this later in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, right? The persecution comes about. They're scattered. What do they do? It says that they, therefore, those who are being scattered went everywhere preaching the word. It didn't say just certain ones. Everyone can have a part in this. Uh, Apostles also here, I, I love this image. The apostles are together. They are unified. They are unified. Do you remember some things that caused some disunity in the apostles in the past? What were some things that caused them to be disunified in their past? It's pretty recent past, too, for them. Yes? Who's going to be the first? Who's going to be at his right and left? Remember James and John arguing about it? And the other apostles being upset. Hey, what do they think they're doing? They're trying to one-up us over here. Oh, that's not happening, is it? They are all together. Uh, think about them, you know, particularly, you know, Peter <laughs> refusing 
to acknowledge Jesus. He's acknowledging him now. Think about him going back to fishing. Remember they went back to fishing and Jesus said, what are y'all doing out here? You're going to fishing again? They're not fishing anymore. They're fishing for the hearts of men. And it's just a beautiful situation of unity among God's people. And I think we need to follow that example. There should be no competition between us. There should be no competitive nature between any of us, between the elders, between the deacons, between our members, between our brethren. There's, this is a unified mission. We're all doing this together. We're all working for the same Lord and Master. These apostles had gotten that down now because the Holy Spirit revealed everything to them. Everything became clear to them now. They understood what their mission was. They understood what to do. That revelation we have in whole now in the Word of God. So we should have the same unity that they would have then. We have the whole message that we need uh, now, just like the apostles would have had the whole of God's truth at that time. Uh, ours is written down. We can read it all the time and understand it. Let's look at verses 14 uh, through 21. 14 through 21. Let's read this together. Uh, it says, But Peter, standing up at the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall see, will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. Excuse me, dream dreams. And on my man servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And that shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's sermon is the one that is recorded here in chapter 2. But notice something here that he stood up with the eleven. So some have suggested that there were 12 sermons going on at that time. Uh, being preached on this occasion, with each of the apostles meeting with a group speaking a particular language or dialect. Uh, those could understand one apostle would listen to him. Those who could understand another apostle would listen to him. Whether they were each speaking to groups or simply standing by Peter as he spoke and maybe translating what Peter said in those languages, what we have is Peter's sermon. That's what we have. We have Peter's sermon recorded. And we know it's not everything he said. Uh, in verse 40 it says, "...with many other words they testify and exhort the multitude." What we have is exactly what God wants us to have. We have the exact message God wants us to know. We have this sermon that gives us what we need to know from that day. Uh, it says in uh, Acts 2.37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. It's not just Peter there. Remember, they're unified. It's the apostles doing this together. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What in this sermon caused them to think this? What did, what did Peter preach that caused them to evoke this question in their minds? What did he taught them that day? You remember some things he taught? Well, right before that, he says, you crucified the Christ. That, that seems like that would cause some remorse and worry. Yeah. yeah, he points out what really happened. He tells them who this person really was that they had crucified. You know, first he refutes the frivolous charge, right? He says, these men are not drunk. These aren't drunk. And I'm going to point you to a prophecy here and tell you this prophecy is talking about what's happening right now. This prophecy is being fulfilled. Verses 17 through 18, new revelations are given. Uh, this old order is going to be replaced. A new covenant, a new Israel. The day of salvation has come. And you killed the Savior. You killed the ruler. You killed the anointed one. Their response is what I would hope that Everyone's response would be, but it's not everyone's response. Men and brethren, what shall we do? The day of salvation has come. Let's look at uh, verses 22 through 36. 22 through 36. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. If you remember, these miracles were unable to be refuted. If you read the Gospels, there was no doubt about these miracles having occurred. 
In verse 23, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that He should be held by it. For David says concerning Him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. David prophesied about the Savior's resurrection. And a few of the key points he he mentions there that are in this prophecy in Psalm 16, 8 through 11, which is being quoted here, uh, what are some of the distinctions he makes there in that prophecy? What, why, what are the things that make Jesus different than David and the one that he's speaking about here? He's been raised. He's been raised. Jesus, yeah. The, the, Jesus' body didn't see corruption. It didn't decay in the tomb. He was raised from the dead. David's body, it, it's, it's in the tomb still. He said to this day, it's a, it's a bunch of bones. It's already decayed. What else do we find here? That's a distinction made. Yeah. David may have been a man after God's own heart, but it says here that God has made this Jesus who they crucified both Lord and Christ, both King and Messiah. Yeah. He's Lord and Christ. He's the anointed. But David is not ultimately the Messiah. So, uh, yes, great distinction. Um, The apostles are witnesses to this. God has exalted Jesus to his own right hand, you know, Um, and then also the evidence seen before them. The spirit is poured out on them just the way that they had witnessed it occur before this before this sermon was preached. So David's prophecy is fulfilled by Christ. It's not fulfilled by David. Uh, David's still in the tomb. Christ was raised to sit on his throne. The apostles were eyewitnesses through it and Christ produced the Pentecost miracles there. Uh, I, I'm asked a question number three, according to verse 33, who made the speaking in tongues possible? We've talked about that. This is God making this possible uh, through Jesus, uh, Jesus and delivering of the Holy Spirit there in verse 33. Uh, verse 34 through 36, talk about the, the, uh, this idea of David, Jesus being raised as Lord and Christ. Uh, of course, there are a lot of false doctrines out there floating around. Uh, that basically deny these facts. Uh, if you think about the idea of reincarnation, that denies resurrection. Reincarnation is not resurrection. Uh, modernism denies miracles, denies historical events, dis- denies these pious, uh, these claims as just basically pious legends of some sort. No, these things really happened. These were witnessed events. Uh, the theory of premillennialism denies Christ is now ruling in his kingdom, which he is right now. We've just been told he is now. Uh, let's look at verse 37 through 40. 37 through 40. He says, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. He is preaching it just directly. There are many who were convinced, but they don't know yet what to do, right? They heard this, but they go, what do we do now? 
What did Peter tell him to do? What did he tell him? Repent. Be baptized. What is, what is repentance? Turning. Yeah. Turning away. Turning. It's, it's really more or less a military term. It's an about face. It's 180. Turn away from this and towards something else. So he's telling them, turn away from what you've been doing and turn towards Jesus. Turn away. Uh, repentance. Repentance is not just a mental assent, right? It's an action. Something we do. They were told to do this, to repent. And to be baptized. And what was this baptism going to accomplish? And in whose name was it going to be? Name of Jesus. It's by His authority. And what was it going to accomplish? Remission of sins. Sins were forgiven. Whenever whenever Billy, one of the preachers we support in India, talks about the uh, appeal of the gospel, we we ask him, what's so appealing about the gospel to these tribal peoples and the villages he goes, forgiveness. <laughs> you don't have forgiveness in Hinduism. It's not there. It's not available. And, and it's, it's so cleansing. They can have peace and knowledge that I'm okay with God. God has accepted me now. This is a huge gift. And if you'll think about it, if you're like me, I sometimes take this gift for granted in my daily life. I need to remember this every single day that the only reason I have peace is because forgiveness exists and I, can, I have access to it. So I repent. I was baptized. And I want you to think about something as well. What, what is so good about the Gospel? What is so good about the Gospel for you? If you can't put that into words, put it into words this afternoon. How is the gospel good for you? Because I want you to be able to tell that to someone else. Let me tell you why the gospel is so good for me. These people, they were receiving something. What if someone told you to your face, you crucified the Messiah. You killed Him. He was God in the flesh. You murdered Him. How would you be able to sleep? How would you be able to go on knowing that? Well, God doesn't hold back on His forgiveness. He delivers that day. He delivers it that day. Anyone who wanted to be forgiven of it could get it that day. You and I who have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, we have that. There's a reason why we sleep well at night. There's a reason why we have peace in our families. There's a reason why we have peace with each other. Because we're forgiven. Because God has given us Jesus to take away all of our sins. That's what's being proclaimed from this day. Repent and be baptized. And it was the Gospel. Good news. That's what it means. It's heralding good news. It's good tidings. That's what the Gospel is. So what is the good news for you? I can tell you for me, it's taken a lot of... It's taken all my sins away and it has given me the only way, the only source of peace I could ever have in my life. And as I look back on my life, it's given me the best life I could ever imagine because my joy doesn't originate in the current events of life or my health or anything else. My joy rests in that day in which my sins were forgiven. And every day that I have my sins taken away that I commit regrettably on occasion now. So I am so thankful, and we should be thankful. Be able to tell someone, what does it mean to you? What is the good news for me? What's the good news for Stephen? What's the good news for your name? Put your name in there. He told them that they must call on the Lord the way that they're calling. And it's whoever. Notice here, whosoever, in verse 21. Whosoever. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was the prophecy. That's what was being fulfilled here. Whoever calls on His name. Isn't this wonderful that people around the world on the other side of the planet are saved as well? It's not just Americans. It's everyone in the world, no matter where they are in a tribe, uh, in in Africa, if they're in a city in Romania, if they're anywhere in China, uh, suffering persecution for their faith, they can be saved. Uh, We see evidence of this, this idea that it's intended for all throughout the Scriptures. Um, uh, If you want to talk more about that, 
we can. This calling, of course, it results in salvation. Uh, it, it includes baptism. The calling does re- include baptism. This is not something that we pray through. It's not a prayer that we pray. He told them to do something. They had to do it um, in order to gain the access to salvation. So question number six, I want to spend the balance of our time really talking a little bit about this, mostly, which is how is the gift of the Holy Spirit related to the promise in verse 39? So we see that, that in verse uh, 38, he says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So there's something related there, this promise. Something was promised uh, that was being delivered this day. The promise that was being delivered that day that was available to everyone was it the Holy Spirit baptism? No, it was salvation. Salvation was being promised to anyone who would obey. Was it the laying on of hands and getting a spiritual gift that day? Not everyone would get that. That's not a promise to everyone. The promises to everyone is that I can now repent and be baptized and be saved. This is truly a gift. Is it not a gift or is it a gift? Did I earn it when I got baptized? No. It is a gift, isn't it? It's a, it's, it was given to me. It's something that I didn't earn. Something I didn't, I didn't you know, work off. Uh, it's not something I deserved. It, it's a gift. And how, how is the Holy Spirit involved in that gift? How is, it, how is He involved? And it, He is a being. It is, I do say He on purpose. It's not an it. He, the Holy Spirit. How, what, how, how was He involved in it on the day of Pentecost? How was he involved in people receiving the gift? How would they know about it? They didn't know unless, yeah, J.D.? He made his presence known. He made his presence known. He made his presence known. He came upon the apostles. They revealed, who, who gave the apostles the information that they now had? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's very active. We're going to find the Holy Spirit's really active in this, in this book. And it's okay to talk about the Holy Spirit. (laughs) It's okay to say His name. It's okay to say the Spirit of truth. It's okay to say the Holy Spirit did something. He did a lot. He did a lot. So don't shy away um, from talking about scriptural things in scriptural ways. It's okay. We sometimes shy away from it because He's hard to understand sometimes or hard to put our mind around because He never occupied a fleshly body or never exposed Him. Jesus, you could see Him, you know? Uh, God spoke with people directly in the, in the patriarchal age and, and yeah, he made himself known on Mount Sinai and other things. But the Holy Spirit, like, well, what, what does he look like? Where is he? Um, what's he doing? Well, we can ask those questions and find Bible answers. I believe the promise that was made was to you and to your children and all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. That's the promise. And that's what's being delivered here. Um, and the, the gift, it is a gift. And one of the key passages that helps me understand this, this idea of the promise uh, and the Holy Spirit's involvement, and look at Titus 3, Titus 3, 4 through 7. I think this is probably the easiest for me to understand. I try to go for easy for me uh, to help me understand it clearly. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We just talked about that, right? Not because of me. But according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I like this passage because it talks about pouring out. (laughs) He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. But what's He pouring out? You know, when I went into a similar baptistry like this in a church building down in Houston, I, I went down to this water and I got wet. And, you know, the, the preacher pushed me down the water and he got me out and my body got wet. But is that all that happened? Is that what baptism is? Is just me getting wet? What happens in the spiritual realm? What happens to my soul? What happens to, to me as a, 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 a being that's going to be around forever? in one way or another sins are being washed away 
How does that happen? Is it a physical process? Does the, the water wash it off my skin? No, I, I believe it says renewing of the Holy Spirit. There's something that's happening in the spiritual realm. There's activity going on that's, that's causing those sins to be washed away. There's a spiritual component to this. It's not just a physical thing. There's spiritual work being done. Um, God has made this possible. I believe this washing of regeneration, I believe that's baptism. That's washing of regeneration. I'm being regenerated. I'm being made holy. I'm being saved. And it's poured out on me abundantly. Is it not abundant? It is abundant. There's a lot of forgiveness that was given to me. Was there a lot of forgiveness given to you? Or just a little bit? A lot. A lot. What did it cost for me to get it? Jesus' blood. That's what it cost. It cost my Savior's blood. I'd say that's pouring out on me abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't that what the passage says? Pouring out on me abundantly. And if you look at this idea of gift, you know, Jesus talks about the gift. John 4.10, He talks about if you knew the gift of God, if you knew this gift, if you knew about the living water, in Galatians we see that we're heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.26, Romans 6.22, we've all been set free. And he talks about, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. These all make sense to me. They all add up, and it makes me appreciate that the Holy Spirit is involved in me actually receiving this gift of my salvation. And I'm so thankful that he revealed the truth to me. We would not have known it if he hadn't revealed it. The Holy Spirit is very much a part of of God's delivering of salvation. Any questions or comments about that before we move on? Yeah, David. I, my question is going back. I, I don't know if you. Oh no, go ahead. You can go back. Okay. Back when he talks about the prophecy of Joel. Yeah. Uh, mm. I, I agree with what he said. That yeah. The Holy Spirit only became only apostles, but if. if the prophecy of Joel, he says this is what's happening now. And it talks about the Holy Spirit being coming out on men and women and sons and daughters and yeah. a whole lot of people. And uh, yeah. what's a good way to explain that? So the way I look at it, and the, it helps me is understand that prophecy being fulfilled and talked about in the New Testament helps me understand the scope of the prophecy. So Peter's saying, this is happening in your presence today. What happened? That's the fulfillment of this. So how, is, how are all of these people going to be benefited by the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? I don't see him naming names, individuals. He doesn't say people's names formally. I think that he is not addressing individual humans. I think he's trying to represent all segments of society. And he's saying all, all segments, your men, women, young, old, slave, free, they're all going to benefit from this. The benefit will be to everyone. Now, the actual Holy Spirit gifts, we know that's not what happened. So we have to kind of look at it in reverse. What happened to explain the prophecy that was given? That's, that's the best way I can look at it. So I know that on that day, not everyone received Holy Spirit gifts. That's, that did not happen. It's factual. I, I can look at Acts and know that did not happen. So if I want to extrapolate more from the prophecy of Joel than I should, then that's where I get in trouble. That's, that's my take on that. Um, I don't believe that he was prophesying that every single individual receive uh, supernatural gifts at that time because that's not what occurred. So I have to look back and see. Any, any other comments about that? Yes? If you go to Acts 1 to 8, um, yeah. it says that the apostles would be the witnesses unto all the people of Judea and Samaria. That yeah. Why would they need a witness brought to them if they all had spiritual gifts to know themselves directly that, that God had intervened in the situation? It, it demonstrates in the phrasing that the, the witness responsibility, the Holy Spirit being poured out on people be limited to the apostles and a few specific people that they like hands with. Yeah, great point. Great point. That, that's a good logical thought. You know, if, if all had received the Holy Spirit gifts, why would they need to have revelation? It would all be instantly given. 
That's a good logical thought. Uh, thank you so much. I think we're out of time, but uh, we'll, we'll pick up with chapter three this next week, and you'll have the benefit of Stu's wisdom next week. Thank you so much for your comments and your attention.